G'day, g'day How you going? What do you know? He'll strike a light G'day, g'day And how you going? Just say g'day, g'day, g'day And you'll be right if you turn in your Bible to Colossians chapter 2 as we continue our journey through the Bible, Colossians chapter 2, we're going to be looking at verses 8 through 10 this morning, 8 through 10, and the title of this message is, You Are Complete in Christ, You Are Complete in Christ. And by way of introduction, this will probably be a difficult message for many people. It's going to be difficult because one of the, this is one of those passages of Scripture uh, where it draws a line in the sand. Uh, there are some things that are of God and there are things that are not of God. And in a world like today, people don't like that. They like everything's of God, everything's in. Uh, we want a viewpoint and spiritual philosophy where everything's of equal value uh, without the result uh, and with the result of being, can't we all just get along? But you see, the Bible doesn't give us that option. Uh, the Bible draws a line in the sand. Uh, not only are there spiritual philosophies and worldviews that are not of God, but there are spiritual philosophies and worldviews that are be, uh, by design destructive and opposed to the work of God and what God wants to do in our lives. Uh, and therefore, as a Christian, we need to watch out. We need to look out for these things and don't be sucked into them. Uh, and, and what you see is what was happening to the people there in Colossae. Uh, Epaphras made this long journey from Colossae to Rome where Paul was in jail to consent with him and to t share what was happening in the environment there concerning these false teachers and false um, uh, teaching that was happening in that time that invaded the church and uh, were tearing it apart. The Gnostics were getting uh, them uh, into this group of people. Uh, they were, uh, had this quest for deeper knowledge and weird philosophies. The Judaizers were sucking them into legalism and rituals and returning to the law. Uh, and there was a group that was just trying to tell them that all this uh, spirituality came through self-denial and hyper self-discipline and all this other weird stuff that was going on. The believers in Colossae were falling for it. And they were being destroyed in the process. And so Paul was going to address these teachings one by one. And he's going to tell these saints there in Colossae the truth about the cults and their teachings. And he starts off by warning them against this worldly philosophy and the traditions of men. Which brings us to our text this morning. Notice verse 8 through 10. He starts off and says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men according to the basic principles of the world and not according to christ for in him dwells all the fullness of the godhead bodily and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power let's pray Father, as we open up your word, that you would teach us, that you would instruct us, that we would have clarity and understanding of what you want to say to each and every one of us. I pray that all of us would understand how we are complete in you and that you are everything that we need. So we ask that you would bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. In chapter 2 here, Paul the Apostle encourages the church there in Colossae and their spiritual maturity. Uh, but in the midst of this discussion, he says that he was telling them the thing so that no one would be deceived by these fine-sounding arguments as we talked about last week in verse 4. He comes now back to this idea again in verse 8, and essentially he's saying this, that see that no one takes you captive uh, through hollow and deceptive philosophies. Uh, or dependent upon human tradition and the basic principles of the world rather than Christ. And that error was surrounding the people in Colossae. False teachers were ever present at that time and Paul wanted to guard these trusted followers. Paul never had, um, th this warning is so important, it's so urgent. Uh, there, there's uh, no greater measure of urgency than the present right now and so there has never been a time in the history of our country even today when there's been more diverse teaching that's going on 
You not only see it in our country here in Australia, but around the world, false doctrine has crept in to the churches. A mixture of religious ideas has become so much more pronounced as even as Eastern religions has come into Christian churches with all the yoga and all the other mysticism that's going on, mixed with many other man-made ideas. And you might even be at an event where there's a follower of Islam on one side and a New Ager on the next. And so it's a difficult issue that we need to understand that not all those things are true. They're not true. They're false. We need to stand for what is true, what is right, what is uh, uh, of, uh, of the word. And so uh, it's important stuff that we, we dig into and understand what this passage is saying. The great Donald uh, uh, Barnhouse, uh, who's a pastor and theologian and scholar and writer, uh, he once told the story of a childhood prank uh, that he and his friends used to play downtown in Philadelphia. And so they would gather on a busy street corner and they would look up into the sky. And one of the boys would say, yes, it is. To which the other boy replied, no it isn't. And as they stood staring up into the sky, the crowd would then begin to gather around them. And the boy would then slip out of the crowd and they would watch humorously as people started to stare into nothingness, uh, wondering what's going on. And so commenting on this, Barnhouse said, that little incident is a good illustration of all the earth-born religions. People are talking about having faith and they tell you to look in a direction when there's absolutely nothing. And some people are so desperately in need of seeing something, they will look until they're almost blind and they'll never catch a glimpse of anything real, end quote. And so Paul's great concern for the Colossian believers was that they wouldn't be left astray off the path of their devotion to Christ. They would keep their eyes on the real deal, not on something that's false or something that's nothing less. And so there, there was danger for these believers to revert back to man-made philosophy uh, that was a religious system and not after Christ. And so Paul knew that this would lead to bondage. And so he did two things. Number one, he issued a warning of the deficiency of man's philosophy, as we see there in verse 8. And then secondly, as we see in verses 9 and 10, he prescribes a safeguard of Christ's sufficiency. Christ is that sufficiency. Christ is that safeguard. And so for a Christian to be avoid, uh, to avoid this being spoiled, we must understand the sufficiency of Christ and also the completeness that we have in Christ. It's in him that we're whole. You see, the bottom line that Paul was uh, arguing uh, here is always going to be the sufficiency of Christ. The sufficiency of Christ, the, uh, his, his grace is sufficient for us, as he mentions in 2 Corinthians. But um, he brings this sufficiency of Christ to crescendo with one of the greatest verses in the Bible, one of the greatest verses in the New Testament regards to the person and the nature of Jesus. As he says there in verse 9, for in him, Jesus Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So if you're looking for a verse that nails the deity of Jesus Christ, it's right here. He was all that God is in bodily form. It doesn't get any clearer than this right here. But here's the staggering thought. It's the fullness of his deity that makes us complete. In other words, if the fullness of God resides in Jesus Christ, and Jesus lives in us, then what more do you need? You see, the false teachers were telling the saints there that there was a lot more that they needed. They needed deeper knowledge. That they needed greater spiritual wisdom. They needed spiritual guides. They needed to line themselves up with the great spiritual traditions of men and women that had come before them. But notice what Paul says there back in verse 8. Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of this world. The word beware there... It's a word of warning. It is a present active imperative, uh, to get specific. 
It's a command to be on constant alert. So it's not how I, I, I saw it in the past. No, you need to be constant alert, watching what's going on. Be constantly looking out, keeping a watchful eye ever open. Since error is rarely separate from personality, Christians need to watch for men bringing a false message. Heretical messengers can be any, notice that, any person, any man, even in the church. It identifies the identity that suggests that believers should scrutinize fellow church members and also itinerant preachers. We need to be watchful for this. As Paul warned the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, verse 29, For I know this, that after my departure, grievous wolves will come among you, not sparing the flock, also yourselves, and shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw men disciples after them. Watch, therefore, and remember that by the space of three years I have ceased, not ceased to warn you, Uh, day and night with tears. So he was warning them, he was teaching them, the whole counsel of God's word, of what would happen. So people were discerning and hearing what was going on. And as we see with Paul, he was deeply concerned about the false teachers, and therefore he calls for vigilance. They are in danger of being deceived by human wisdom, and that's based on a worldview, an unbiblical worldview for that matter. And so Paul's beware alerts them as a seriousness in their situation. And then they're needed to be attentive to the possibility of being misled uh, through a false pursuit of wisdom and knowledge. So here's the clue to the Colossian heresy. It included the philosophy, the traditions of men, the science of that day, and worldly thinking. Philosophy literally means the love of wisdom. Now, it is not evil in and of itself to, uh, to, to have wisdom, but if it becomes evil when men seek wisdom apart from Jesus Christ. And here's the word that uh, used to, to describe man's attempt to find out his own intellect and uh, to research the things that can only be known by uh, what God can reveal to them, divine revelation. It is evil... Because it exalts human reasoning above God and worships and serves the creature rather than the creator. Exactly what evolution does. Uh, It uh, is characteristics of of the liberals of our day uh, with their boasting of intellectualism and rationalism. And, And notice the other word that's in the verse there, empty deceit which refers to false and valueless teaching of those who profess to offer their secret truths to an inner circle group of people. So there's nothing really to it when it comes down to what they're teaching. But it rather gathers a following by catering to man's curiosity. They start to become curious how this is very interesting and they continue to go down this path. It also appeals to their vanity by making them uh, members of the select few. So they feel privileged. It it stokes their their pride. And so Paul's warning them of this kind of teaching that does nothing for the soul and negates the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's not according to Christ. The false teaching will always be subtle. Please understand that. It will always be subtle. False teaching is not uh, a a blatant disavowal of our accepted beliefs. Um, It is usually an exaggeration of some kernel of truth, um, but it's one element of truth that is taken to an extreme. A lot of times it's taken out of context. Most false teaching and teachers will not stand up and scream, this is a false teacher, this is a false teaching, or this is a teaching which contradicts the Bible. They will never say that. Instead, they will take a portion of the Bible and misuse it. They will misquote the verse. And it will only take one element of truth to an extreme that will discount the rest of the truth. It's a distortion. They will also, not only will it be subtle, but it will also be attractive. And it will be, and, and they always use uh, Bible quoting. Because they sound, well, they like, it sounds like they know their Bible. They're quoting from the Bible. They can't be wrong. 
but they're taking things out of context. They're twisting it to make it uh, to what their own agenda is. The Colossian heresy promised much, uh, but because it was man-made, it did not deliver and would not deliver. So the emphasis here is on the word men, uh, and therefore they are to reject worldly ideas. Now please understand that the Bible is not down on knowledge or learning uh, or the pursuit of wisdom. Uh, In fact, just the opposite is true. Uh, You read through the book of Proverbs, in fact, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 13 and 14 says, Happy is the man uh, who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. So God wants us to acquire wisdom and knowledge, but the question will come from the source. Where's the source of this coming from? Where is this wisdom? Where is this knowledge going to come from? Are, Are we going to God or are we looking for somewhere else? Now, you have to understand there's a lot of sources of wisdom and knowledge uh, in the world today. But the bottom line is, is that you don't have to go looking for them. They come looking for you. So what's going on in our world today? It's a battle of worldviews. Everyone has a worldview. Everyone has a perspective in life. And uh, whatever that is and whatever they want, uh, wants to be prevailing. <coughs> The, the, the liberal, there's a liberal worldview, there's a conservative worldview, there's a scientific worldview, and there's a religious worldview. There's a spiritual worldview, and you have a materialistic worldview, you have an environmental worldview, you have the urban hip-hop worldview, and the list can go on and on and on. But I want you to see is that uh, some of these worldviews are very powerful, and they have incredible platforms to preach from the universities the colleges the high schools today um another example is uh something that i know was a very very powerful platform when i was in high school and college um it was called mtv still around today but mtv has is very focused very powerful worldview with specific ideas on politics on sexuality on religion, God, morality, fashion, authority, environment, global community, etc. They push and promote this idea, this philosophy, worldview. And uh, they promote it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all over the globe and multiple stations around the world. They have primetime specials where millions and millions of people are watching this. And now it's, of course, on the internet. And so they're promoting their worldview. And when you go into any country in the world, not only are you going to find a Mac is there, but you're going to find uh, MTV. It is an agenda that is promoted. In fact, uh, many years ago, I was in the um, Honduras doing some mission work, and halfway through our time there, I uh, we went to this coast uh, town called Tella. Uh, remote place, and of course, in your room, in your hotel, you have this t- t- television. You turn it on, and guess what was there? MTV. It's, it's being promoted. It's being pushed to the kids of our generation. I was greatly impacted by it. I know kids today are still impacted by this agenda. And, uh, and it's by design at war with God's worldview and God's view. It's not just one of, and this is just one of many sites that we can um, share with you this morning. But Paul warns us today, beware lest anyone or should carry you with devious worldviews that are empty and deceitful. So the word that Paul uses here for beware, it's a Greek word which means to be in a state of constant watchfulness. We mentioned that already. To always be on lookout for. And the idea is that these conflicting worldviews, these conflicting uh, philosophies are going to come out uh, to us from every direction. Some are going to be very subtle. And others are going to be so in your face, bold. Uh, And so we have to keep our guard up. We have to keep our eyes open. We have to be watchful. Because here's uh, what these faulty philosophies will do. Notice as the, the, the word says there, it will cheat us. Literally, they will carry us away captive. They will hold us hostage uh, as spoils of war. And so the word, the, uh, the word that Paul uses here, it's a military term to describe what a conquering army would do to the people that they had just conquered. And this is what the world wants to do. They want to conquer you. They want to hold you captive. 
And so this gives a very graphic picture of what the worldviews want to do. They want to capture us. They want to take us prisoner. And again, sometimes it's a full-on assault. Sometimes it's, you know, all guns blazing. Uh, sometimes it's just the slow infiltration over a long period of time. Uh, the political pundits will tell you if they repeat something over and often enough that people will believe it, even if it's a lie. Even if they first utterly reject it at first, but if they tell it over and over, people eventually believe it. And you've heard the term, stay on message. And what they're trying to do is they're going to repeat this thing over, uh, uh, something over and over until the feeble-minded finally believe it. The cults and the people with the opposing worldviews do the same thing. If they can't get you to believe from, from the get-go, they're going to slowly drip it. They're going to slowly continue to pound away this message. So whether it's a full-on assault or subtle infiltration, the result will be the same. The believer will be swept away and robbed of their treasure. And what is the treasure they want to rob us of? The spoil that they want to carry us off? Well, one would be your effectiveness for Christ. And uh, secondly, would be uh, it, it, to, to rob our souls and our relationship with the Lord. So if the enemy of our souls cannot keep you in his camp, that he wants to make sure you're not going to be effective in the kingdom of God. And at the least, that's what's going to happen. He's going to uh, keep us from being ineffective. And at the most, he's going to rob us and destroy us in our relationship with the Lord. <clears throat> and uh, you see, this happens so often in so many people and so many lies. Christians getting caught up with all this other stuff that is really just a distraction from their relationship with the Lord. Uh, and, and, and keeping the main thing the main thing, Jesus Christ. Walking with Him and abiding in Him. And, and their usual thinking is, that if we can just accomplish this thing or that thing, then we can really love Jesus. If we do this, we do that. And so they're adding all these other things uh, to the, 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 the table. And they spend all this time in pursuit of, of things which, if it, if it ever happens or if it doesn't, uh, they, it's not producing the real results that they hoped for. And they end up waking up one day realizing it was just a waste. All these pursuit of these other things, it never satisfied, it never fulfilled. And so it's sad, uh, to say the least, that Satan wants to rob you of your effectiveness for the kingdom. And so at the worst, again, it wants to capture your soul, wants to destroy your relationship with God. And to prove this, all I have to do is ask you the one question. Do you know people at one time, who were on fire for Jesus, who were at one time super effective for the kingdom of God, who are now shipwrecked the faith. I know quite a few in my life. They were once, we were on the street corners witnessing and telling people about Jesus. We did mission trips together, and now he's walked away from the Lord. There is no God. What happened? Very simple. The deceptive worldview and philosophies had taken them captive. They gave in to these worldviews and these platforms and to their lives. And slowly but surely, they brought them in and, and captured them. Are they still saved? Only God truly knows. From the fruit of what's going on in their life, you would doubt it. But only God knows a person's heart and if they're truly saved or if they're in a backslidden state. They're definitely not enjoying life. A backslidden Christian is miserable. Now, the weapons that are used to accomplish these empty deceits and deceitful philosophies are grounded in the traditions of men and the elementary things of the world. The problem is not with philosophy in general, but empty, deceitful philosophies that have their sources in men and elementary things of the world. So Paul wasn't uh, against the philosophy per se. Um, uh, he, he was opposed to the, the specific type of philosophy itself. The Greek it reads the philosophy. So it was the love of wisdom for the sake of wisdom. Not, not the sake of love or, or for, for the Lord, but as the sake of having wisdom, intellectual stuff. It was a philosophy that was humanistic, as Paul spoke in the first Corinthians, the wisdom of this world is foolishness. I've taken philosophy classes in college and it was just the most boring thing because it was wisdom of this world and it ended up being just foolishness with God. 
True wisdom is found in the fear of the Lord, and it centers in Christ. And there's, where, there's a lot of pastors and, and preachers that are out there uh, that are not using the Word of God. And, but it's, it's the philosophy of men. It's entertainment. It's motivational speaking. And there's no substance. It's not feeding your soul. And, and what is taught is empty. It has no substance to edify. It's void of spiritual truth, of power, and of hope. And notice what Paul says in first, or Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. says, time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust will heap for themselves teachers having itching ears, and they will turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall be turned to fables. And this is what you see happening all the time with so many churches out there. People have these itching ears. They want to hear this fluffy stuff. Motivate me. Encourage me. And don't get me wrong. We need to be encouraged. But we need to feed our souls. That's the only thing that's going to make the real difference in our life. Now I have to tell you. This is where things get, uh, can get a little difficult. Because what we're going to have to do is separate the things that are the sources of men. And the things that have their source in God. And this is one of those things that you, you have to know about philosophy and uh, or spiritual technique or psychological uh, cure is where did it come from? Where's the source? Uh, is it God's solution or is it man's solution? So there's the two different worldviews right there. Now to tell you the difference, man's solution will always take you back to fixing the past, uh, fixing the old nature uh, that, that man has to work with. That's all they have to work with. Uh, they have no control over the future. Uh, we're, we're out of control of the present. And this is why usually we're talking about things in the past. So we have to go back and try to fix those things from our childhood. Uh, we go back to the old nature, the old man, the old woman. God's solution brings forgiveness in the past, transformation in the present, and walks us into the future uh, that he has prepared for us in Christ. So one is backward looking, the other is forward looking. One has the emphasis on our failures in the past, the other has the, the victories of our future, which is in Christ. And one has our focus of our old nature, while the other is our new nature that we have in Christ. It couldn't be any more different than that. It's night and day difference, friends. But here's the problem. Man's solution involves trying to fix the past by putting blame on someone else. Not taking responsibility for your actions and behavior, but you've got to blame someone else, you've got to accuse someone else. Uh, and, and who doesn't like to do that, right? Everyone likes to blame someone else. Well, it's because I did this. I was growing up in this environment. This is the way I am. Uh, let, let me illustrate this. I was having this conversation with a gentleman the other day. And uh, he was struggling with his identity, his self-esteem, and, and, and some weight issues. And so their doctor referred them to some psychiatrist and psychologist, well, I can't remember the term he used there, one of the two, uh, who took them down this path of hypnosis and uh, took them back to a childhood where uh, the psychiatrist, psychologist uh, um, said that, oh, you're abused as a child, you know, and, uh, and this is why you're overweight. This is why you lack self-esteem because your parent abused you. So this individual ended up calling his brothers and sisters and, you know, for a meeting, just this is the news that I came, you know, uh, to uh, from uh, the psychiatrist. And so the individual asked one of the other, uh, because this individual doesn't remember any of that, that happened. So he asked the other brother and sister, were, do you remember any instances that you were abused as a child? And so the brother said, there's a lot of abuse in the house, but it wasn't that they were being abused by their parent but the children were abusing their parents, you know? It was the other way around because it was, it was a child-run home. And um, so they're wanting to blame the parent. They're, they're, they're wanting to blame someone else for their, which, by the way, they ate too much and they ate too much of the wrong food, which is the bottom line for why they were overweight. But I'm sure that they wish they could blame their parents for their actions and their behavior and the way, the, the way they are. But they can't. And this is the way so many people do. They want to blame everyone else instead of take ownership of their actions and the behavior. Now, that might oversimplify the point, but you see how it works. The cure is in the past. 
The cure was finding someone else to blame uh, so we can be off the hook. Now, let me tell you God's solution. God wants to bring forgiveness and healing uh, in the past. He, he wants to bring transformation in the present and walk us into our future in Christ. How? Through repentance. Uh, through a willingness to forgive and uh, the, the renewing of our minds and washing of the word, as it tells us in Ephesians, by obedience to his word, by abiding in Christ, by commitment to spiritual growth, which will result in maturity. Now, those things take all those failures and those pasts, the hurts of the past, and moves us toward the new creation that we are in Christ. That God's cure is always to move us forward, not to hold us in the past and, and not to keep us in the present. As Paul says in chapter 3 in Philippians, he says this in verse 13, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now this is kind of, and I hate the term forgive yourself, but essentially you need to get over it, you need to move on. Only God can forgive. You can't forgive yourself. But this is essentially what Paul was saying uh, Forget those things that are behind. So essentially, if you're going to say forgive yourself, forget those things which are behind. So Paul wasn't going back. He was moving forward to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. But that takes repentance, a willingness to forgive, a commitment to know the word of God, to be obedient to the word of God, uh, obedience to the word. It takes abiding in Christ, a desire to grow as a man and woman of God. Now, let me tell you how this worked in my life. When I first got saved, uh, I was involved in some bad stuff. I, I, I listened to a lot of heavy metal music and death metal and grindcore. I, I was a drummer in a band called Obliteration. Pleasant name. And uh, <clears throat> so, so I loved that sort of stuff for a long time. And I had a hard time letting that go. And what I was doing in the world, I was still carrying it into the church. Well, there's some brothers that, uh, you know, I was in fellowship with and, uh, you know, and going to Bible studies with, and they noticed my actions and my behavior. Because I always said, oh, this music doesn't affect me. Really? And so they asked me what was going on. And, um, and again, I had nothing to hide, so I just shared them my love for the music and, and all that sort of stuff. And so after I was done saying all that and what I was used to, one of the guys looked at me and says, you need to give that stuff up. You know, it's not glorifying the Lord, and it's not helping you in your walk with the Lord. In fact, uh, when I got married, I had a box of all my heavy metal tapes and CDs and stuff, and uh, um, <clears throat> Nikki said, that's not coming in our house. You need to get rid of that stuff. So, so that tells you I'm still working on it. You know, I mean, I've been married for 17 years now, so that's not, not there, but, uh, but I had to get rid of it, and I had a struggle getting rid of that music. And so, uh, but what, they, what did they do? They didn't say, well, you know, you're, you're messed up and we're going to need to get you some therapy. Uh, we need to put you in some type of course and, and work through this uh, addiction of yours there, you know. They said, no, this is sin and you need to repent of it. End of story, you know. You, repentance, you see, is to do that U-turn. It means to go in the opposite direction. It's realizing that you're going in the wrong way and you need to make that change. And it's so freeing when you do repent, when it's true, godly repentance. Uh, not just, oh, I'm sorry, I got caught repentance, but it's like truly remorseful. This is because I was worshiping Satan when it came down to it. You know, I was listening to it, I was glorifying Satan in the process and you can't worship God and Satan at the same time. So I need to stop doing those things. I needed to repent. And then what they did is they said, you know what? I want you to read this. In fact, Colossians chapter 3 was the first chapter I read and talked about the new nature and, and what I need to put off and put on. And uh, as I did, my heart began to change. My thinking began to change. Uh, was it instantaneous? No. Uh, it, it was a process of time. Uh, that, and, and it was so freeing once it did happen. Uh, and, and fortunately, these guys, they continue to um, keep me accountable. You know, how's it going with this? Uh, and I remember so clearly one of these guys who was discipling me at the time, he was telling me uh, how some of the, because I was sharing, I still struggle with it. I still like it, etc. And he, And I'll never forget it. He says, what part of renewing your mind? What part of, you know, denying self, uh, putting off these things? Because I had an anger problem. Wrath, 
you know, uh, as the, it tells us in Colossians 3 8. B- malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth um, that you don't understand. And that was one of those turning points for me. And uh, here's what I did I had a very clear understanding of what was wrong and, and what was expected of me. And I had to repent of those things. I need to stop doing them. And I need to be set free and start pursuing Christ. And then I was given those clear instructions by what the Word of God tells me. It, I didn't have to go through counseling class. This told me everything that I needed. And, um, and so by studying and reading and, and understanding, my heart, my mind were changed. It was renewed. And uh, I was put into a challenge to put these things into practice. And, and it was good to have these people to continue to um, keep me accountable. It worked. God delivered me. He changed me. And as a result, I discovered that verses 9 and 10 of this chapter is also life-changing, which brings up the second main point of our passage here, the safeguard of Christ's sufficiency. Notice verse 9. For in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Him, who is the head of all principality and powers. And there's healing when you understand you're complete in Christ. Your identity is in Christ. Notice the, the connective word for there, which indicates the reason why believers should be aware of the philosophy and not after Christ. The fullness of God is in Christ. Jesus Christ, bottom line, is God. So if Christ is the fullness of the Godhead dwells, then he is the source of all truth. And any teaching which does, is not in accordance with that is false. Uh, remember back in chapter 1, verse 19, where it says, For it pleased that the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell. As Paul's saying the same thing also here in verse uh, uh, 9. For in him uh, dwell all the fullness of the Godhead. And this is perhaps one of the most definitive statements of the deity of Jesus Christ in the Bible. This verse shatters all attempts to disprove the deity of Christ. Now, One of the things that cults and intellects will always do and the empty philosophies and the traditions of men will always come after is the person of Jesus Christ and the sufficiency of Christ. They'll always try to make Jesus less than who he is. They will try to decrease his importance in your life, uh, which of course allows them to increase their importance in your life. The Gnostics were doing this by making Jesus uh, lower than he is. The Judaizers were doing that by adding laws and rituals and ceremonies to salvation. And, uh, but what Paul tells him here is that Jesus plus nothing, um, because there's nothing that you can add uh, to the one who is the fullness in the deity in bodily form. You see, that's who Jesus is. Jesus is not some enlightened man. He was not a man who uh, was filled with Christ's consciousness. Uh, He is not a, a, a man who became God. No, he is God who became a man and dwelt among us. And when people were in the presence of Jesus, they were in the presence of God. And that's all that God is. The dwellness dwelt in Christ, the fullness of deity that took the shape of a man and dwelt among us. So much so that Jesus... When he was, said to his disciples, in answering a question, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen God. Uh, and, and that's a, just an amazing, staggering thought. If you're one of those disciples, you're seeing God face to face through Jesus. And that's why if you have Jesus, you have it all. If you have Jesus, you are complete in him. He is your healer. He is your savior. He is your deliverer. He is the savior of your soul. He is your peace. He is your power. He is your joy. He is your strength. He is your mighty God. He is the everlasting father. He is the prince of peace. He is your sacrifice. He is your offering. He is your atonement. He is the ransom for your sins. He is your rock. He is your high tower, your comfort in times of trouble. He is your way, the truth, and the life. He is your light. He is the food for your soul. He is your King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the Alpha and the Omega. And He is your soon and coming King. You are complete in Him. Please understand that, friends. And knowing that will eliminate some of the worldly philosophies and and the things that are just empty, deceitful of value. Let the world fix your broken cars. Let the world fix your, your broken computers. But never let them touch your soul. 
There's only one who is capable of touching your souls and healing our broken hearts and repairing your crushed spirits, and that is Jesus Christ and Him alone. If you have Jesus, you have it all. In Him, you are complete. He is all that we need, both now and for eternity to come. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your grace and mercy. We thank you that we are complete in you. We thank you for these uh, powerful truths. We pray that we would take heed and that we would be obedient to what your word is telling us individually and corporately as a body. I thank you for your precious people here today. Those who have some deep needs, deep hurts or wounds or whatever's going on in their life, that they would surrender it all to you. We thank you that you're in control. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn